My name is Mikko Hyppönen. I, uh, I've been working for the past 20 years researching, analyzing viruses and tracking online criminals for F-Secure Corporation. The internet is a reflection of the real world. And just like the real world has problems with criminals and crime and bad people, obviously we have exactly the same problems in the online world. So since I've spent pretty much most of my life watching these online criminals, I wanted to share with you my view of who we actually are fighting today. Because if we understand where the attacks are coming from, we are much better equipped in actually fighting these problems. I mean, we can try to solve these problems by having technical solutions, having all the antiviruses, all the firewalls, all the patching, all the backups. But if we really want to go a bit deeper, we have to understand where the attacks are coming from. And of course, the attacks are global, and they're going on right now. When we track with our systems where different attacks are coming from and where they're going, there's, they're constantly. We are right now finding more than 100,000 new malicious samples of malware every single day. It's just totally out of control. But where are these coming from? And I group the current attackers into three main groups. We have the organized criminal gangs. Then we have different kind of attacks coming from hacktivists. And then we have attacks which are launched by different countries and nation states. So first, criminals who make money. Organized criminal gangs. Gangs operating from Russia, from Ukraine, from Kazakhstan, from Belarus, from Romania, from China, from Brazil. These are global issues. And these guys, their motivation is money. And money is a good motivator. People do pretty much anything for money. And if they can make good income by writing viruses, infecting people's computers, they will be doing that. And they have been doing it since around 2003. We found the very first PC viruses 25 years ago in 1986. But we found the very first money-making viruses only around eight years ago. And today, the internet is full of millionaires who became millionaires by writing viruses and infecting people's computers. For example, this photo right here was found during a forensic examination of a Linux server which was used as a drop site for a banking Trojan attack. On that server was a deleted folder which had deleted images taken from a digital camera. One of those images was this. We tried to estimate how much money there's in the photo. It's around one and a half million dollars which looks like a lot of money, but then again, we have to remember that value of the dollar has been going down, so. <laughs> Here's iframe biz. This is a website run in St. Petersburg, Russia. It's specializing in buying access to infected computers. So if you are a virus writer anywhere in the world, you can infect computers, you can simply sell the, the access to those infected home computers and corporate computers to these guys. They'll pay you money for infected machines. Which, of course, then means they have to be able to monetize those computers somehow. And you can sort of see the, the lifestyle image they're trying to portray to people they would like to buy infected computers from. Like, like <laughs> infect computers, sell them to us, you know, become rich, meet girls. That's the way it works. This is uh, uh, Albert, known as um, Segwek online, photographed in the uh, penthouse suite of, I believe, the Peninsula Hotel in New York while he's hacking away. Here's his partner in grime, Mr. Watt, known online as Unix Terrorist, partying, uh, I believe, in the same hotel in the, in the pool. Nice lifestyle. How can these guys afford a lifestyle like this? Well, they can afford it by paying their bills with your credit cards. That's what they do. So these are Americans, but of course we have attackers coming from, from Eastern Europe as well, like Dmitry Golubov from the city of Kyiv, which is in Ukraine, or Vladimir Chachin from the city of Tartu, which is in Estonia. And big amount of the attacks these guys are making are actually being monetized through things like keyloggers. Keyloggers sit on your computer and save everything you type. So you know, every password you type is saved and sent to the criminals. Every email you type is saved and sent to the criminals. Every Google search you do, the same thing. Every 
Bing search, you do the same thing. Of course, that's a joke. They're not really recording Bing searches because nobody uses Bing, but... <laughs> nice, smooth. Now, <laughs> the real target of these attacks, of course, is to have the keylogger active when you do online shopping. Because when you do online shopping, you will be typing in your name, address, credit card number, expiration date, security code, which means they gain access to your systems. And many of these guys have made a total business out of these operations. They run websites where they, can, where they will buy access to infected computers, where they buy and sell stolen credit card numbers, buy access to infected uh, servers. This is a flash animation from a website called Carter Planet, where they advertise their services, you know, buy credit cards from us, become rich, be independent. So it's become very organized. And this is the biggest problem we fight. Organized criminal gangs are the single biggest problem we have. But then we have these guys. Group number two, hacktivists. Social activists who operate globally thanks to the internet. The internet is global. No distances, no borders. And People who would like to protest against something used to be able to do it locally. Now, of course, they can do it globally, and they can do it everywhere in the world. Groups like Anonymous made the headlines um, late last year. They've been around for quite a while, but they really only started making headlines when they started large-scale attacks, mostly related to the WikiLeaks saga, trying to shut down websites of companies like Visa and MasterCard, and so on. Anonymous is like an amoeba. It changes structure. No clear leadership, no clear roster, no clear membership list. Different operations have different people behind them. And nobody really knows who's actually a member and who's not. Like they say themselves, we are all anonymous. But he decided to investigate this. This is Mr. Aaron Barr. He used to be the CEO for a company called HP Gary Federal a security company which did a lot of consulting for the U.S. government. And they specialized, well, in many things, but one was social, um, gathering intelligence from social networks. So Mr. Aaron Barr infiltrated these different chat boards and online forums used by different anonymous operations, became one of them, collected information about their group. And then he gave an interview about this. He spoke to a journalist called Andy Greenberg from the Forbes and explained that he's done all this research and he's going to make all this information public next week in a conference in San Francisco. And this was in February. He gave the interview on Friday. It was printed on Forbes.com on Friday. He was due to give the talk on Tuesday. He never did. Because during the weekend, his Facebook was hacked. His Twitter was hacked. His email accounts were hacked. The Email archives of the whole company was hacked. In fact, they were put online, and they are still online today on a system where anybody, including any of you, can go and search for the whole, uh, the whole email history of this company for the past five years since then the company was started, including reading every single confidential email, every single private email, every single classified email that this company has sent or received, which is pretty devastating. And it's a good example of just how ruthless Groups like these can be when they feel threatened. And then we have group number three, nation states, countries launching the attacks. And we've seen online espionage and spying for a number of years. Spying, of course, is collecting information. Information, obviously, is data today. If you want to reach information, you don't really go after paper and physical locations anymore. You go after the computers and the computer networks. And we know of the attacks, like the Aurora attack against Google itself last year, and many, many similar cases. And then we have other kinds of attacks, like what's been going in Iran. Um, Iranian hackers have gained access to at least two certificate authorities, so they are able to issue SSL certificates and code signing certificates, including issuing SSL certificates for a fake certificate for Google.com, apparently because then the Iranian government can monitor <coughs> dissidents within Iran while they are using Gmail to do their uh, communication. And then we have cyber sabotage, maybe in the future real cyber warfare. 
Best example, of course, is what we saw with Stuxnet. Stuxnet, the worm we found in the summer of 2010. Stuxnet, which is the first worm in history that targets automation systems. In fact, it targets these. This is a Siemens S7400. It's a PLC box, roughly this size, cost you around $5,000. And this is what runs our modern societies. This runs factories, volley belts, heaters, pumps. The elevators in this building are most likely controlled by something like this. And that's what Stuxnet targeted. And through that, targeted the nuclear enrichment program in Iran. So, what can we do about these three problems? Problem number one, organized criminal gangs. The solutions are obvious. I mean, of course, we, can, we have to do technical safeguards, like taking backups, patching, running on the viruses. That's clear. But even more importantly, we should be able to catch these guys, find them, and put them behind the bars. And that's something we're doing really, really poorly at the time. Hacktivists. Well, this is the next generation. That's the generation that's growing up. The generation that doesn't know of a time when the internet wasn't around. And for them, it seems to be as natural to go online and launch denial of service attacks to make their point as it is to go to the streets and have a real world protest. And we have to be able to reach them and explain to them that it's not the same thing. Freedom of speech, support, and you can go and have a peaceful protest. Going online and launching denial of service attacks is illegal. And then we have the last group, nation states behind these attacks. And that is a tough problem. Because I think universally it's probably a good thing that somebody's doing something about the Iranian nuclear program. Right? That's probably not something we try to stop. But we have a real problem that we have security mostly being provided by private security companies from independent countries. And if you are getting your uh, security solutions from a vendor in country A and you actually might be worried about attacks targeting your own country from the same country, things get really complicated. So, while the internet really is global, the situation is that the borders still sometimes matter. Thank you very much.